This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to every single one of you, including Dr. X17, Dustin Campbell, and Tim Deputy. Coming up on DTNS, why Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, why it isn't causing chaos yet, and Molly Wood explains why Silicon Valley is like this. Plus, is Samsung faking moon photos? This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, the 13th of March? <laughs> I forgot what month it was. 2023 in Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. From lovely Cleveland of the Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. And coming from the D.C. area, your boy Chris Ashley. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. Joining me is my good friend, climate tech investor and former tech journalist, Molly Wood. Welcome to the show. Thank you. What a delight to be here. Yay! It's good to have you. Um, we have got lots of excellent insights to share with you folks today. Let's start with the quick hits. Wall Street Journal sources say Amazon and Rivian are in talks to end their exclusivity deal. Right now, the agreement calls for Rivian to sell all of its electric vans to Amazon. Amazon reportedly told Rivian that it only needs about 10,000 vans this year, and Rivian would like to sell delivery vans to other customers. An Amazon spokesperson did say that the company remains committed to buying 100,000 vans from Rivian by 2030. Uh, Amazon is also Rivian's largest shareholder. It has a 17% stake in the company, as well as a seat on Rivian's board of directors. Microsoft confirmed to IGN that it will not have a booth on the show floor at E3 in Los Angeles this June. Don't fret, though. The company still showed some support for E3, saying it will be co-streaming our event as part of E3 Digital. Nintendo already announced it will not be at the event. No word from Sony officially yet. So they're like that employee that just doesn't want to come into work. Like, we'll do the digital. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Uh, we previously told you that Google was testing removing news content from Canadian viewers in an advance of the possible passage of Canada's Online News Act, a.k.a. Bill C-18. You can check out our February 23rd episode if you want the full explanation of that bill. But essentially, it requires an agreement to be made before linking to news. On Saturday, Meta responded saying it would end access to news content for Canadian Facebook and Instagram users if that bill were to become law. Meta says links to news make up less than 3% of its content, similar to what it did in Australia before Australia passed a similar law. This bill passed Canada's House of Commons in December and the Canadian Senate is considering it now. Radio service TuneIn rolled out an interactive map feature called TuneIn Explorer to its iOS and Android apps. TuneIn Explorer has been available on the web since last month and can access more than 100,000 local AM and FM radio stations from almost every country in the world, including WRUW-FM if you search over Cleveland. You click on the radio tab at the top of the TuneIn mobile app, then zoom in to find a specific region or uh, type in a specific location or a station into the search bar at the bottom left-hand side. Filters can surface music genres like classical, rock, hip-hop, the things you'd expect, plus news, sports, and podcasts, and you can also search by language. Another advance for Mastodon and the ActivityPub protocol, WordPress and Tumblr's parent company Automatic has purchased the ActivityPub for WordPress plugin and recruited its developer to work for WordPress. That plugin lets readers follow a WordPress blog on their preferred Mastodon server or actually any other ActivityPub service, uh, Friendica, PixelFed, etc. Replies to the posts can then become blog comments. TechCrunch notes that Automatic Automatic is also testing support of the AT protocol. That's the one being used by Project Blue Sky. And that is the Quick Hits. All right, well, Samsung unveiled a 100x space zoom feature back in 2020 with its S20 Ultra phone all the way many, many years ago. We were, we were, it was a different time. It showed off the ability to take highly detailed photos of the moon in a lot of its marketing material. Back in 2021, Input Mag accused Samsung of fake detailed moon photos taken on the Galaxy S21 Ultra. At the time, Samsung claimed no image overlaying or texture effects are applied when taking a photo, but that it does use some AI to detect the moon's presence and then offers a detail enhancing function by reducing blur and noises. Well, on Friday, Reddit user iBreakPhotos did a little experiment to prove Samsung was faking details in the moon photos. First, they took an intentionally blurry photo of the moon. They displayed the blurry photo on a computer screen and took a photo of that 
with the Samsung S23 Ultra, which created a more detailed photo of the moon. iBreak Photos claims the results goes beyond pixel upscaling or lost data correction. So the question is, when does AI enhancement turn into a fake photo? I mean, Where's Molly, the line, everybody, I, 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 all of us are like, I don't you know. You gotta be kidding me. You know what? I, re I really like those um, photos that you can take of the moon with the Samsung 23 Ultra. My brother has that. This story is so near and dear to my heart because he is always bragging about his moon photos. And I'm like, oh, I want to get one so I can see why they do it because mm -hmm. it did make me consider buying one. But also, I do not care. And the pantheon <laughs> of deep fakes. This couldn't be lower on my priority list. <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? This is this is going to be everything. This is going to be not just the moon. So I get why people are mad at Samsung because they're marketing it so heavily of like, we could take a picture of the moon, but it's really, they trained their data set to recreate the moon if it sees a moon-like photo uh, in a way that's plausible. That's going to happen to everybody. You're going to be able to train this thing on your friends and family so that every picture of your friends and family looks great too and not blurry. I, this is the world we live in now. The thing I mean, that I find amazing about this is the, is how deep these conspiracies can actually run in something so simple. Like on the face of it, you're like, ah, who cares? But when you look at the testing that they actually did, taking photos, using tripods, using a $3,000 camera to take a picture of the moon to compare it to what Samsung is doing, I couldn't have been laughing harder when I was reading about this article. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like Samsung's initial denial or at least clarification like back in 2021 is like just to delay people from doing the exact same thing, uh, because like it does like all, all of these algorithms, whether it's like face smoothing or beauty filters that they put on by default on selfie cameras or it's uh, we're going to paste on a picture that an awesome picture of the moon over your terrible picture of the moon that you took at night handheld with a 250 millimeter zoom is like the idea that this is just shortening intention, right? Like the, the, it's not about like the, the truth of the moon. It's your intention is to take an awesome photo of the moon that you can share on social media and people go, the moon, that looks great. I love yeah. that. It's over your house. That's it really, cool. it really and, is not the crime. It's the cover up here. If yeah. Samsung had just said, everybody knows what the moon looks like. And so when you take a photo, we will overlay a more detailed version of the actual moon. Nobody's messing with the moon landscapes. We're going to use some overlays of the actual moon to make your moon photo look better. Then everybody would be like, cool. It's really hard to take a picture of the moon. Thanks, Samsung. They, did, instead, they did say that. They said they add a detail enhancing function. Do, is it not clear to you that that's exactly <laughs> what they're doing? Like, like the like first of all, like the idea that like you could yeah, well. re reduce blur and like maintain like that in and of itself tells me that's already like a if if you're if you're interested in photographic truth, let's just tug on that string to even think if it's possible. Like mm -hmm. the, the idea that like we're reducing blur, which is like an inherent part of the capture, which means your shutter speed was too slow and your hand was shaking too much because you're at an extreme zoom and you took a picture of the moon and it's all blurry. That that reduction in and of itself like is re removes the kind like you're approximating the moon at that point, even if it's not like this wholesale yeah. AI replacement which it seems like it clearly is. Also, we know what the moon looks like. It's easy to train <laughs> an engine to recreate quantity, the moon. Yeah. And then it's going to look like what it looked like when you took the picture. You're going to look at the real sky. You're going to look at your picture and go like, oh yeah, that looks pretty much the same because the moon doesn't change a lot. Uh, if they start adding things into like real life photos, like, wait, that person wasn't there. That Those trees didn't exist. Then I think we've got a bigger problem. But I don't think they're going to be able to do this with everything. This, Which is, I guess makes this worse because it's like, and then they're marketing this like they have something special when it's really just something that any any company that has some AI could do. To be yeah, but fair, you have to be able to zoom a lot to even get to the. I mean, I do think they do still have something special in terms yeah. of that absurd zoom. That absurd zoom is absurd and mm -hmm. it's amazing. And the <laughs> fact that then after that you have to like add on some known moon characteristics to make it look all the way like the moon is is like the blue cheese with the wings, right? Like Samsung is still the only one giving you the wings. Sure, or, or the blue cheese. Or yeah. the blue cheese. To be fair, they said you that, hey, this is just AI. We ain't adding no overlays. We're not doing a thing. You just taking the picture and we're touching it up a bit. So yeah. I was like, all right. Yeah. I wish we had that right now. I was wishing we were on Zoom right now because I can't 
I forgot that my face looks like this, for example. <laughs> like, I'm ready for AI. Yeah. See, yeah, it's it's just intention shortening. You intend to look good on your teleconferencing call. It, whatever system could get me closer to there, whatever system can get me. Like, and again, th this is, if you turn off the, uh, uh, you know, th there are features that you can turn off uh, the detail improvement uh, uh, and, or scene optimizer is what it's yeah, called. Yeah, yeah, you can just turn You can turn that off, that off right. and then that does turn that off and then all your selfies will look like the barbarous reality uh, that is at least my face. So like th there is like an opt out also. And again, it's just like, tell me that like, we're going to make your photos of the moon look awesome. Like I, I almost, I, I like, I, I do wonder how, what the extent of this was, right? Like if it's like, Hey, if you take a picture of the Eiffel tower, mm, it's probably going to stink, but <laughs> guess what? Mm, you know, like, <laughs> again, that's a fixed, moon. that's a fixed quantity. That's a, that's a mm -hmm. thing like we have amazing photos of. You're not going to take that amazing photo, but we can paste that into what, what they're missing is what's really needed, which is the opposite of this, because, you know, mm. they need to be able to say, OK, I'm on a Zoom call at work, but I'm in the shower. I need to remove all of me coming out of the shower and just have me at the desk, you know, instantaneously, of course. So they're, right. they're, I think they're looking at it in the wrong direction. We do. Well, we just have to embrace it. I want to live in a world where this is my biggest scandal. That's the world <laughs> I want to live in. How do I get uh, there? I could would have thought that that Rich, Chris and Molly were using machine learning because they look so great today. But uh, if you agree, let them know in our discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Have you all heard of Silicon Valley Bank? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me more. You have now. You have right. probably heard something about it. Uh, but in case you missed Friday's DTNS or you haven't been glued to CNBC, or maybe you're like, yeah, I heard about it. I need a refresher. Let's catch you up. We're going to tell you how this happened, uh, what the U.S. has done about it, and get Molly's thoughts on what this means for Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley Bank, I'm going to call it SVB for short, is the bank for about half the U.S. tech sector, very roughly speaking. SVB made conservative investments. I think that's misunderstood. These were too conservative. That's the problem. Bonds and mortgage-backed securities, and not the, the bad mortgage-backed securities from 2008. These were long-term, low-yield investments, uh, the kind of thing that, let's say, just if you hold them for 20 years, you get a 1% return. Very safe, very conservative, uh, but very long-term. And deposits are short term. You put money in the bank, you pull it back out again all the time. Businesses do that at least a couple of times a month for payroll, if not a whole lot more. Uh, if businesses continue to generate revenue, get regular rounds of funding from investors, those deposits are going to grow even with the constant in and out. But if interest rates rise, funding starts to decrease. Revenue might also start to decrease. And if that happens, those deposits get smaller. What a bank does in that case is usually cashes out some of its investments. It's capitalization, if you've heard that word, to cover the withdrawals. What SVB ran into is that those rising interest rates meant that they had to take a loss on those long-term investments that they had. Because if I can buy a bond today that gives me a 5% interest rate, why would I pay full price for one of those dusty old SVB bonds that only gives me a 1% interest rate? So they had to sell them at a discount. They lost money on them. Even with the losses, SVB can still cover its withdrawals. It was just going to lose money, and that's not going to look good on the balance sheet, and the shareholders are not going to like that because the bank needs to be profitable. So it had a plan. It would sell more stock. The plan was to make take the money from the stock sale, cover the loss from selling the bonds and invest some of that money in short-term securities with a higher payout. That way they're positioned better for the future. Shareholders get to see a profit. Deposits are covered. Everybody wins. Except announcing a stock sale made some people assume things were worse than they seemed. That caused the stock price to drop. That meant you couldn't get people interested in buying the stock. That made people even more worried as the stock price dropped and investors, including Peter Thiel's Founders Fund, Union Square Ventures, and Coach U Management, started advising clients to pull their deposits. Once too many deposits are pulled, the bank runs short on cash. You've probably seen It's a Wonderful Life. You know the rest. Except 
SVB CEO Greg Becker is no Jimmy Stewart. That stock sale collapsed. They couldn't sell the stock. And as you found out Friday, within a day, the state of California had stepped in to take over the bank and hand it over to the FDIC. That's where we were Friday. Now, adding a little bit to this panic, on Sunday, regulators in New York closed Signature Bank. Uh, Signature was used widely by companies involved in cryptocurrencies, and a lot of those began withdrawing deposits after SVB went down. So you got all that. That brings us to Monday, which I've just checked is still today. A lot of uncertainty over the weekend. Here is where we are now. Okay, so all depositors at SVB and Signature Bank will have access to their full deposits. This was going back and forth. We got clarification that is going to happen. The FDIC, of course, only insures deposits up to $250,000 per depositor. And that only covered about 10% of SVB's deposits. So the FDIC announced it would insure the rest of the deposits above that $250,000 threshold without using taxpayer money, a big uh, you know, political question there. Essentially, it sounds like the FDIC will sell off the bonds at a loss to raise cash. Eh, that would hurt stockholders and some debt holders, but depositors won't lose anything. Kind of a big deal for this whole bank thing. Whatever other money it needs will come from the Federal Deposit Insurance Fund, and a special assessment will be made from all banks who pay into that fund to cover that amount. So other banks will be paying into that. The FDIC also announced a bank term funding program that offers better terms for one-year loans to help any other banks that may struggles as we potentially see more and more ripple effects from this. So it's stockholders of SVB and U.S. banks who will end up paying, not taxpayers, at least directly. All right. So that's where we are now. Molly Wood has covered tech for a couple of decades, is working in the venture capital sector right now. Uh, Molly, I don't know if you, you saw Ben Thompson's Stratechery uh, post, but he posited that a lack of trust within the Silicon Valley community played a part here with the, the run on the bank. Why, why do you think we saw this? Yeah, I, I mean, millions of pixels, millions of characters have been spilled already and will continue to be spilled, I think, on the causes. There they were many, you know, as you laid out, there was sort of the structural financial part of this. There was a huge communications failure by Silicon Valley Bank in terms of how it communicated and announced its equity raise and the fact that it had sold some of these assets at a loss um, that I think contributed to that lack of trust. And then you do have it, the the rumors that were flying around over the weekend were wild and up to and including, you know, conspiracies by crypto bros and investors angry about the reaction to the FTX situation and the mm. collapse of the Silvergate bank wanting to in on some level prove that, Hey, your traditional DeFi you know, or your traditional financial system uh, isn't so hot either. I know that I'm on Tom's show, so I'm like going to play it a little bit cool. With <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I don't buy those rumors at all. But However, yeah. there is a grain of truth to everything. And one of the grains here is that there is, I think, a sense in the Valley that is certain, you know, there's this sort of like wing of this community that's really into libertarianism and not trusting mm -hmm. institutions. And the more you talk about crypto and the more you talk about decentralized finance as an alternative, and the more you try to say the existing financial system is corrupt or untrustworthy, or they loan out more than they have, you know, in hand, which some of those things are true. You can eat pretty easily start to chip away at a fundamental trust in a bank. Yeah. And then when you have that combined with just the Twitter brain thing, it's pretty easy to trigger a run, maybe arguably way, way too easy. I, I could buy that, whether intentionally or unintentionally, there was an undermining of, of trust in Silicon Valley Bank, because there's an undermining and trust in all institutions going yes. on right now. And that when they do a slightly unfortunate thing, uh, but but a very reasonable response that there would be a crime of opportunity there, right? Peter Thiel and others can just jump on like, hey, everybody pull it out because this thing's going down. And then that causes it to go down. Right. And and to be clear, the purchase of, you know, yes, on the one hand, all Silicon Valley Bank did was buy government paper, 
the safest stuff in the world, 10 year bonds, mortgage backed securities. A bad move, apparently. But, <laughs> but yeah. it was it it was a pretty criminally bad move, actually, yeah. because at yeah. the time that they bought, like it was pretty clear to every it's been clear for at least a year that interest rates were gonna go up. Now, I don't I th- I think this system is suffering from a macroeconomic shock about how fast interest rates have risen, but that was not a surprise to anybody. So to have bought 10 year bonds that in some cases had a like less than 2% yield without putting into any into place any financial mechanisms to hedge against an interest rate rise was definitely banking malpractice and there w- had you know a couple of years back there were regulations that would have probably stopped it from doing that and those mm-hmm. were removed so there's like there's a lot of kind of banking industry mistakes that are real and then there is this Again, constant undermining of not only every institution, but specifically banking. Like if you look at the people who are true believers in crypto, the core of that true true belief is that banks can't be trusted. And and things move fast. This this might have moved. It may have been the intention of somebody to erode the reputation, and they ended up taking down a bank by accident because of how quickly things can move now compared to 2008 even, right? I've seen actually some good comments to the effect that like a big, a big driver here, a big factor is just mobile. Just the mm-hmm. fact that you could do this online, you could trigger yeah. a bank run with your thumbs yeah. that is carried out electronically and that it, it, that it happens so fast that it's before, in some cases, like the tweet got sent if you're in my neighborhood and don't have good Wi-Fi. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so it, Molly. It, it, Oh, sorry. oh, go ahead, Chris. No, go ahead. Now, how, how did uh, VCs view SVB when, uh, you know, in, in, because uh, essentially in in a small nutshell, they're doing the same things, right? They're looking for businesses to invest into just albeit completely in different standards. How, how did they uh, typically view this bank in the first place? I mean, SVB, I think this is one of the other big surprises, actually, was that the community and and high profile members of the community did not come out with messaging to rally around Silicon Valley Bank faster and louder because Mm -hmm. this, like Tom said, it's a bank that services fully half of the tech sector. Uh, Firms, investment firms have their money there. Individual venture capitalists have their money there. Everybody in the Valley at some level directs a founder to work with them because it's the kind of bank that offers like a whole stack full. Oh God, I said stack. <laughs> Am I? It's okay. It's okay. But they they do provide a whole collection of services that are in some yeah. cases sort of specifically tailored to this industry. Like nobody else in some cases is going to give you a mortgage with equity in your startup that doesn't have any revenue as collateral. And I'm not saying that Silicon Valley Bank did that to an irresponsible degree that we know of, but it was a part of an ecosystem where usually if you have a conversation with just a banker at Bank of America, for example, and you're like, well, I'm building this startup and the total addressable market is this, and I have this much funding coming in. And they're going to be like, no, thank you. Right. You don't get a mortgage. Yeah. But, but that's SVB not what, the, say, the crazy thing is that's not what brought them down. It was the bonds. That... No, no, not in the slightest. I'm just you're saying right. that's the yeah, kind yeah. of relationship. Like when you look at how deep SVB goes in the in this industry. Yeah. And I think why, they would rally. You would think that they would rally and the impact of losing this bank and and losing access to those kinds of like specific sector tailored services, which, by the way, if they exist at other banks or they existed on Friday, they don't today (laughs) is going to be a massive it's going to have a huge impact. It it made me think like just reviewing how fast everything moved that a lot of times we think of uh, communications as kind of ancillary to the business or like like a like a cherry on top of of your kind of your business operations and and thinking about that in this specific case as like an existential way to to keep a ba- like a run on a bank going like that like kind of has forever changed like how I, I i'm i'm hoping that this isn't a revolution to banks either that like like that communication is not just like this is our press release but like in real time, we need to stay on top of this, be in contact with kind of this larger investment community uh, uh, for that kind of rallying effect, I think uh, will be a lesson going forward for sure. And I, th- I think one of the interesting things here too is that uh, the lesson that the FDIC is trying to teach is that we'll keep the depositors covered, but the stockholders and the people who have debt are not gonna win if you let a bank uh, fail. 
Mm-hmm. We'll see if that that lesson sticks. Go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. What were you going to no, say? No, it's okay. No, because that's a, a very important point. I, I was just uh, going to say the the one thing that concerns me is you no, know, not the, what's happening now, but uh, you know, there's some great ideas out there that are going to require money. Uh, mm-hmm. to to get going so uh, you know are the vcs gonna just say you know it's business as usual for us even though you know we've lost a great resource um or are we just gonna see a lot of innovation start to stifle because they can't get their stuff off the ground yeah and, yeah I, I mean i think that ripple there is a lot of relief right now about this fed backstop there are going to be a lot of political ripple effects Rich alluded to that already that, you know, because the thing is like in many, 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 many cases, the depositors that we're talking about are small businesses. You know, I saw a tweet that, that said it might be better if we call them startups Mm -hmm. or or small businesses instead of smartups because startups, because they are many of those businesses will be saved by this action. And also many venture capitalists who had money in this bank of more than $250,000 will also be saved by this rescue package. And everybody knows that a a fund that is built on bank fees means probably higher fees to consumers in the end. So there's going to be sort of like that political ripple effect, which will affect this industry. There will be changes in the availability of banking. And then also the sphere, which I, I mean, I have to tell you, like, I know this all too well, that there is a there is like a a naked, sweaty panic that you can smell from LA coming from Silicon Valley right now in terms of like the economy. And so a lot of things are going to freeze up. Like Chris, to your point, a lot of companies are not going to get funded in the near term. I think you're going to see a bit of a deep freeze across this industry for a little while. And I don't know how long it's going to last. And now you could also, on the other hand, you could argue that what this is doing, and I don't mean to be callous, but that we do have a forest that's very, very overgrown, right? Because Mm -hmm. of this like zero rate environment, there are a lot of things that exist now that wouldn't exist in a tougher economic environment. And a lot of that's going to get burned out faster than people expected. But if you have a good idea and a great business plan and product market fit, I think you're still going to get funded, but it's going to be a lot harder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And somebody's going to take over for Silicon Valley Bank, whether it's whoever buys Silicon Valley Bank or or something else. Uh, but but from what you're saying, Molly, it sounds like it won't be as easy. Who whatever happens, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. It's a bit. It's a it's a huge deal. Even though there's even though those deposits are ex- and by the way, they always would have been. It just would have taken time. Yeah, People yeah. were always going to be able to get their money out. It's just that if you are in fact a small business, I mean, imagine that you run a business and all of a sudden you only have access to yeah. $250,000 to run the whole thing. Imagine if I had to run payroll two days from now on March 15th. Right. Thank goodness. I'm not in Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> no. And you can't, you can't get your money. So yeah. the, it was the, it was the time Delta between the availability and the need that was really going to potentially put hundreds and maybe thousands of companies out of business. But what's going to happen now is just going to be like a slower apocalypse. Yeah, we we saw those headlines with Roku and Etsy, uh, you know, having money tied up there that were making the rounds. So, um, you know, I'm sure one of hundreds of examples. In fact, I think we have a pretty good example of some additional perspective on this in our mailbag, Tom. Yes, we do. Allison Sheridan uh, wrote in and said the explanation on DTNS uh, on Friday was appropriately from the perspective of tech startups. And at one point, someone said FDIC will make the startups whole. I enjoyed this because we were wine tasting in Santa Barbara when the news hit. So the news perspective we saw was main bank supporting wineries closes. All of the same info you described, but talking about how will wine tasting occur if the bank is closed. It's all a matter of perspective. Allison pointing out exactly what you were just saying, Molly, about it's small businesses, whether they're startups or not. Absolutely. No. Yeah. All right. And uh, we were talking about Wing's new drone delivery system on Thursday on DTNS. And Mark thinks Sarah hit on a solution to the drone recharging problem. He said she was talking about the challenges of recharging delivery drones. And then she mentioned that it's similar to the EV car charging station problem. 
And that's the solution. <gasps> Build drone recharging stations right into the EV charging stations. Get the delivery and car companies to collaborate on the financing. And we're golden. Electrical charging for all. There, Mark? Sarah solved it. Look at that. Yeah. All right. Wow. That is so smart. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, before we get out of here, of course, we have to thank Chris Ashley for always bringing the good stuff. Chris, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, where can people find out some of more of your great stuff? If they're oh, you, you can definitely find me and the boys on SMR Podcast and, then, of course, me and Rod on Barbecue and Tech. And this week we took a little swing at doing some vegan barbecue. Uh, everything you, you see on that picture is uh, 100% vegan. And it's, there's no reason why you can't get some good barbecue for your peoples that don't eat meat. That was Excellent. a good episode. Uh, yeah, if you want, you want to hear the best description of jackfruit, go check out barbecue and tech, bbq and tech .com. Mm -hmm. All right, and thanks also to Molly Wood. All it took was a banking crisis. Thank you so much for being here. What are you up to online these days, Molly? I have a Substack. That's right. <laughs> I've crossed over. <laughs> Mollywood.substack.com. I'm still occasionally on Twitter at Mollywood and Mollywood Pro on Instagram, just doing my thing. And thanks to our brand new boss, Brian, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Brian, for being with us. It's always good to have a new patron. That means we keep to get to keep doing the show. Uh, Brian is welcome. All the rest of the patrons, welcome Brian in. Uh, and, and what is Brian going to get as a new patron, Rich? Well, he's going to get Good Day Internet. That's our extended show. And we're going to be talking about Silicon Valley culture with Molly and Chris getting in on some of the on-the-ground perspective and some outside perspective. Yeah. Good stuff. More there of the good go, stuff. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Patrick Norton. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>